right. So, um, first of all, uh, why should we bother thinking about the concept of knowability? And, and I think the answer is pretty clear. There's an important role in philosophy. And there are lots of philosophical questions involved in knowability, like uh, is every truth knowable? Are there truths that are knowable independently of experience and so on? And so they, they all mention the concept of knowability, but you know, what, what does it mean exactly? Now, um, most of us agree uh, that uh, knowledge is factive. So if you know something, then it's true. By the way, I will be using uh, symbols um, throughout the talk. I hope you won't get uh, too much distracted by that. Um, I'm, I'm happy to stop and, and explain um, what, what, what they mean. So don't hesitate to interrupt me. So most of us uh, agree that knowledge is factive, but uh, we can also ask, is knowability factive? So if uh, something is knowable, is it then also true? And there are some um, good reasons for wanting a factive concept of knowability. Uh, these are both because in mundane conversations, we often uh, use it in a factive way. So, for instance, if um, the president of the United States asks the uh, uh, chair of the, 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 what is it, the Joint Intelligence, Intelligence Agency, uh, Agencies Committee, you know, are we able to know what is going on in North Korea? Um, well, then he expects truthful answer. Well, there may be political reasons for why he doesn't want them, but, but normally uh, uh, he would expect truthful answers. Uh, to, to that uh, question. And also in, in philosophy, so um, uh, there is an, uh, there are lots of anti realists who claim that truth and knowability coincide. Uh, and that means, and of course, that for them, knowability has to be factored. Um, now, we will consider a range of uh, contemporary concepts here, and we will uh, ask ourselves, you know, are these factive concepts or not? Yeah. Here are the, the concepts that we will talk about, and I will uh, say right from the beginning, this is not an exhaustive list, right? Um, we don't have enough time to cover all the, the different concepts. Jan, can I say one thing? Yeah. Your voice is going in and out. When you turn your head, it looks like to your right, your your voice uh, goes out for not just me, but also other people. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, can you see, signal to me uh, if it happens again? Uh, otherwise, I will just take off the headphone. Maybe that's uh, the cause of the problem. Um, yeah. Um, so... First, we will consider uh, possible knowledge as one way of uh, understanding knowability. Then we will turn to so-called counterfactual knowledge. And actually, we will be discussing the work of uh, one of the people present here, uh, Julian Schroeder. Um, so he can uh, immediately tell us uh, where we go wrong. Uh, and then we will talk about having the capacity to have knowledge. And so three different concepts. These are not the only ones. For instance, in our paper, we also discuss the uh, concept of knowability that is used in so-called dynamic epistemic logic. But I'm going to skip that here. And there are others as well. Right. Now, here's the easiest one. And probably um, this is more or less the, the standard way of thinking of uh, knowability in the contemporary and the philosophy and literature. Uh, Here one says, look, uh, a sentence phi is knowable even only if it is possible to know that phi. Yeah. Um, now, you all know, I guess, that uh, possibilities nowadays uh, analyzed in terms of possible worlds, so something like that. Possibly phi is true at a uh, possible world, even though if there's another possible world uh, that is accessible from the given world in there, phi is true. If you don't know about this, that's fine. Uh, um, I think you will understand almost everything that, that will follow, but it's just a little reminder for um, 
the rest of you. Yeah, I'm going to have to interrupt you again. Uh, uh, other people are also having problems. There's something when you turn your head to the right, uh, your your voice cuts out. Yeah. Let's see. Let's uh, try this way. Can you hear me? Better. Better, yeah. yeah. I had this problem um, a couple of months back as well, and there was a kind of update of the um, the driver of my headphone, and then no. and then there was another update, and then it was fixed. So, um, okay, I hope that this will work, and otherwise, I will give the the, the word to Felipe, and he can just uh, continue. Okay. Um, Now, uh, the problem is that, that if you think of knowability as possible knowledge, then you end up with a non-factive concept of uh, knowability. Uh, for instance, uh, I'm wearing blue uh, trousers today, um, but there's a possible world in, uh, in which I'm wearing gray trousers uh, today, and I'm, I know it because I looked at them before I put them on. Yeah? So then it's possible to know uh, that I'm wearing um, Great trousers, but as a matter of fact, in the actual world, I'm wearing blue trousers. Now, actually, I should have checked. <laughs> uh, as it happens, I'm, I'm actually wearing great trousers, but that's just a coincidence. So, uh, but uh, you understand the, uh, the the example, I hope. Now, um, so the concept of possible knowledge is not a factive one, but you can uh, enforce activity, if you like. Uh, but then, then something happens. So if you um, say, well, look, uh, it has to be the case. And if you possibly know something, then it's true. Uh, then given some little background uh, assumptions, you will derive that the only things that are knowable are necessary truths. Um, and that is problematic because clearly uh, contingent truths are um, Knowable as well, right? Um, it's knowable that there's milk in the fridge. And that's a purely contingent uh, truth. So, this uh, standard default way of understanding knowability doesn't quite cut it. Now, there is a variation on this approach uh, that, for lack of a better term, I will call the possible star knowledge approach. Uh, what does that say? Well, um, it says that uh, sentence five is knowable, even only if it is possible star to know uh, that phi. And what is this possibility star? The idea is that uh, you're only considering other possible roles where all the non-epistemic facts remain the same. So only epistemic facts can change from world to world. So in other possible worlds, you can know more, you can, you can know less, you can know different things, but the, the, the facts of the, the actual world remain the same. And then, of course, uh, quite trivially, you get restricted factivity. So uh, you get that if uh, it's possible to know uh, a non-epistemic truth, yeah, then it's indeed uh, a truth. Um, this has been defended by people like Tennant and others. Um, the problem is that um, acquiring knowledge often requires investigative acts. Yeah. And just by um, uh, starting an investigation, uh, you will change the facts of the world. So, for instance, uh, you want to know how many uh, tennis balls there are in your garden. Uh, and you could go into the garden with a, with a sack and you're just picking up all the tennis balls that you can find and put them in the sack. And afterwards, you, you count them. Then, then you know how many tennis balls there are in your garden. But several non-epistemic facts have changed. Uh, your location has changed. You're now in the garden. Uh, there's a sack in the garden, and so on and so forth. The, the tennis balls are not in the original location anymore. Uh, so um, just by, by investigating the world, you're also typically changing the world in, in even small uh, um, aspects. 
sometimes major aspects, of course. But um, so this uh, distinction between, you know, the epistemic facts and the non-epistemic facts, where you keep the one fix and the other can vary, that's not going to cut it. Um, so this goes out of the window as well. And then um, another um, proposal was made by uh, Dorothy Edgington, and she proposed uh, the following. Uh, so a sentence phi is knowable, even only if it is possible to know that actually phi. So it's possible to know that in the actual world, phi. Um, skipping technical issues. Um, first of all, the good news, uh, you get factivity in a certain sense. Um, for instance, uh, if you know, uh, if you possibly know that's actually phi, then phi is an actual truth. So in this sense, you get uh, factivity. That's good. Um, now, you can prove uh, of, actually, it's, it's an action, uh, so it's a trivial proof uh, that uh, if something is actually true, then it's necessarily actually true. Yeah. So you might say, well, again, we, we are restricting the range of, of uh, knowability to necessary truths. But here, that's not so much seen as a, as a major issue. Um, for one, um, the fact that uh, something is that is necessarily actually true does not entail uh, that it's necessarily true. Yeah? So uh, uh, the fact that necessarily actually there's milk in my fridge does not entail that necessarily there's milk in my fridge. So that's good. That's Because otherwise, yeah, we would want to uh, reject this approach. Moreover, um, we, it's often claimed that uh, you know, saying this is an actual truth, and simply saying this is true, are a priori equivalents. So it seems like you know, this approach um, is still on, on, on a good track. But one major question here is, uh, this was a question asked by, by Williamson, uh, how can you have direct knowledge in a non-actual world about the actual world? Right? It's not as if the actual world is in, in the closet somewhere in, in another possible world, and you can go to the closet and, and open it and then take out the actual world and say, oh, um, I, now I see uh, uh, Jan is wearing great uh, trousers uh, today, right? Now, one way out of this is um, saying, well, yeah, but we don't have the real knowledge about the actual world, but we have knowledge about the actual world via description. And there are different ways of cashing that out. Um, here's one. You say that phi is knowable, even only if. It's possible to know that uh, if alpha, where alpha is, is a, a description of the actual world, then phi. Right? So now it's possible knowledge via a description of the actual world. That's the basic idea. Yeah. Um, the problem is that that can again uh, show that uh, the, the implication of uh, uh, phi by alpha is a necessary one. It's a strict implication. So you, again, are restricting the range of knowability to necessary truths. Yeah. Um, there's a, another variation on this. I'm, I'm going to skip it. Um, but again, you get this problem. So we don't get no ability of contingent truths, only no ability of necessary truths. And that brings me to another proposal. Um, and this is the one by, by Julian. Um, and um, it goes as follows. Uh, I hope uh, I'm explaining it correctly, Julian. Um, so the best thing to do, by the way, so you see this very long formula. In general, what you do when you encounter a long formula is you ignore lots of, most of the complexity initially. Yeah. So what does it say? Now, 
phi is knowable, even only if, well, first, it's known. Of course, if, if it's known, then it's knowable. Yeah? So let's put that aside. That's the trivial uh, side of the disjunction there. Yeah? And then the idea is, uh, look, there is this uh, line of inquiry that you've not actually pursued successfully in the actual world. Um, but if you had successfully pursued it, you would have known phi. That's the simple version. Yeah? Uh, I will first give an, uh, a, an easy example of that, and then I will come back to the complexity. <laughs> um, so, given there's actually a fly on the ceiling, one could have looked at the ceiling, although one did not uh, do so, but very well to do so, one would know that there is a fly on the ceiling. Yeah? Now, I've been ignoring some of the complexity here. Uh, here, what, what uh, Julian is saying uh, is not, well, uh, you would have known that there is a fly on the ceiling, but uh, you would have known that hadn't you looked, there would still be a fly on the ceiling. That's slightly more complex. Uh, I'm not going to discuss it uh, in, in, in great detail, but it has to do with... Uh, uh, the fact that uh, often, and something that you already encountered, when you uh, try to gain knowledge about the world, you're often often going to change the world a little bit. Yeah? So uh, imagine um, you want to know what the pressure is of uh, one of your uh, bike tires. And then how do you do that? Well, you, you use one of these bike couches. Yeah? You put it... Uh, I, uh, well, I don't know how that said, uh, yeah, Ventil is saying, I'm not sure. But anyway, you know what I mean, right? So uh, you attach it to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the tire. And then what, what happens is you let a little bit of air uh, go, right? And then it measures uh, the, the, the pressure. But of course, you have, strictly speaking, reduced the volume of, of uh, air within the, 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 the bike tire a little bit, right? So you've changed the non-epistemic facts a little bit. So to uh, take care of these kind of issues, that there's some uh, some more complexity in here. But this is the general idea. Huh? Seems uh, fair. Um, question: Is it effective? Um, well, uh, Julian added uh, a condition uh, to ensure that this. Um, the idea here is that um, if if you're at uh, at, at the actual world, where you've not successfully pursued this line of inquiry, and then you consider the, the, the closest uh, world at which you have successfully pursued that line of inquiry. And then if you look back you now, what is now from the second world, the, the world uh, that is closest where you've not successfully pursued that line of inquiry, is the actual world. And I'm not going to give you the argument, maybe you can see it uh, very quickly, but this uh, guarantees uh, that, that uh, his concept of knowability is a fact of fun. The problem is that, oh, and I should also mention very important, uh, that um, what is within the scope of the knowledge operator, so that what is known, is not a necessary truth or is not in general a necessary truth. So he's avoiding the uh, issues that were um, setting the proposal of Agenton and, 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 and others. Right. The problem with uh, the principal symmetry that he needs is that there are counterexamples. And so uh, one um, example is as follows. Uh, so here's a line of inquiry. You check the entire contents of the cupboard in the kitchen for cookies. Uh, and in the actual world, before you're walking into the kitchen, uh, one of your children is crying, and, and you go and check on the child instead. So you got distracted, basically. You've not carried out this line of inquiry. But of course, th there is a, a possible world in which uh, you do go into the kitchen and you check the entire contents of the, of the cupboard. But the question is, from the point of view of that, that world in which you've successfully done that, what is now the, the closest world uh, at which you've not done that? 
And, and quite plausibly, this is a world where, for instance, you did walk into the kitchen, you did even open the cupboard, maybe you already looked at the objects right in front of you, but you've not gone through the entire, uh, uh, you've not searched the entire contents of the cupboard yet. So you've not taken the front objects away and then looked at what's in the back and so on. Um, and that's going to be a closer one. That's, that's more similar to, to the, the world in which you've done the entire thing. Um, and maybe you stop there because you were looking at the, the front objects and suddenly you hear the ice cream van. You say, oh, forget about cookies. Uh, I want ice cream. Uh, and then yeah, stop there. Right. So the, there are country examples, and as is, of course, uh, very common in analytic philosophy. Uh, <laughs> somebody proposes something, and, and then uh, people start thinking about country examples. Um, I think this particular uh, problem can be fixed uh, by looking at the internal structure of lines of inquiries. Um, now, don't worry, I, I'm not going to read this entire thing. Uh, just give you the basic idea. Uh, the, the, the way the counterexample works was uh, the, this line of inquiry of, of going to the kitchen and, and checking the entire contents of the cupboard, but there are different steps. And, and uh, from the point of view of the, the, the last step, well, the closest is the, the one where you end at the penultimate step. Uh, and there's a way of reformulating uh, the symmetry principle that takes this into account. And, and it uh, uh, removes the counter example and it restores activity. So that's good news. Um, it's not the only problem with symmetry, though. Um, here's another example. And this uh, was given by Hudson in a, a very different context. And I'm sorry, it's a long quote. Um, the idea is that, um, so consider uh, the, the proposition that there is a pebble at, at spatial temporal location, let's say a beach, right? Uh, and um, when is this uh, uh, pebble lying on that beach? Um, you know, eons before uh, any intelligent life appears on, on Earth, right? Uh, so basically, there are no knowers around um, that, that can know that there is this double uh, line there. Um, now, since we're talking about, the say, metaphysical possibilities, a lot of things are metaphysically possible, you can imagine um, a, a divergent evolution of the Earth, where, for some reason, intelligent life appears much, much sooner on Earth than, than uh, has happened in the actual situation. So I'm not going to speculate on possibilities. You can think about uh, these. Um, and of course, from the point of view of this uh, widely divergent uh, you know, uh, Earth history, um, what is then the closest uh, world at which you know, nobody knows that there's a pebble there? Well, the one where nobody just went to that beach at that time, right? Um, it's not going to be the the, you know, the actual Earth, but it's a very different uh, history. Yeah. Um, so I think these kind of examples still uh, uh, show that there are issues with, with the symmetry principle. Uh, although you can ask, uh, are these lines of inquiries, are they uh, relative to possible agents or actual agents? Because um, if, if they are relative to possible agents, then, then yeah, you have this kind of problem. If you restrict it to actual agents, then I think you might uh, be able to avoid this, this problem. Uh, so um, the upshot here, Julian, good news. Uh, uh, interesting uh, concept of knowability. It's factive, uh, but we have to take into account things like the internal structure of lines of inquiries. Uh, we have to consider uh, whether uh, it's, it's these are lines of inquiries relative to actual agents rather than possible agents. And yeah, um, and I will finish here. And um, 
give Felipe the floor. He's going to discuss uh, the next uh, concept, contemporary concept of knowability. Uh, thank you very much, Jan, for, for giving that uh, the space. So, uh, a different kind of uh, conception of the concept of nobility that is important to discuss is um, it involves the use of the of the language of capacities, dispositions, potentialities, and so on. These terms that we might call dispositional. So in this in this kind of approach, we would say something that no something like that knowability is something like the potentiality to be known or the capacity to be known or the, the disposition to to be known and so on. This uh, kind of approach is interesting if we consider that those concepts are not reducible necessarily to, to counterfactuals or other modalities such as possibilities. And the kind of conception of, of disposition that, that, that we have to be concerned now with uh, will take these concepts as primitive in a certain sense. What I mean here is that is that there's a debate actually in metaphysics about the the nature of these positions, potentialities, and, and capacities. And one approach that one might take would be to just simply reduce those to clusters of counterfactuals or other conditional structures, or maybe sort of classes of possibilities. Those uh, alternatives are not of interest uh, here because then the whole approach will reduce to, to the possibility or counterfactual approaches. Uh, we have uh, an instance, an interesting instance of this approach in uh, Farah's proposal of understanding knowability as the capacity to know. So what he says is what is as follows, that a phi is knowable if and only if actually there is something that has the capacity, that it has the capacity for it to be known. No, no, sorry. Actually, if there is somebody, some agent or, or a, a, a agent that has the capacity for them to know that phi is actual where we understand this uh, operator CX as the capacity to, to do or have something, right? And importantly, this uh, schematic, uh, this somewhat schematic characterization of, of uh, nobility is factive as we want it. Because some, something actually having the capacity to know something actual entails the truth, the actual truth of that something that is known. Also importantly, and clearly, this does not involve knowledge of uh, trans world entities, but rather simply knowledge of actual entities, or more specifically, the actual capacities of actual agents. However, as I said, this is uh, a bit a schematic still, and there, there are some issues with this. Um, with this, I will, I will just, we will just focus on on one issue. There, there are concerns about the individuation of capacities in general, but one aspect that that's important to consider here is that capacities. Um, must be understood as a sort of, in the context of sort of relation between whatever has the capacity and a context where that thing has the capacity, right? So one might think that the capacity to know, for example, is something about the thing that has the capacity having what it takes or something like that, but also, you can think of it in terms of there being the opportunity for the thing to manifest that capacity, right, in a context. Um, and this is important, especially in the case of epistemic capacities such as knowledge that, that, uh, that are grounded on relational facts, right? So knowledge is already a relational 
uh, sort of property and then the possibility to to be in those uh, in those relationships we can think of depending on extrinsic factors or external factors two of uh, those factors that are of note are that we have capacities not only in terms of agents like us have capacities not only in terms of what they by themselves uh, can do or or know or or have an attitude towards to, but also what these agents um, in interaction with uh, with technological features and societal uh, and the societies that are embedded in are able to do in a way. And that's their abilities that these agents can have uh, to exploit these resources in a way are relational and extrinsic, right? An example of this would be to say that the capacity to do certain experiments, for example, in particle physics, will depend on technology, for example, the, the existence of particular particle accelerators, uh, certain training, heavy funding, collaboration international across disciplines, like what we are doing here, right? Like, uh, Jeremy, we're collaborating. The things that we are able to know together are more than what we could know come to know separately, right? Well, hopefully. Sometimes I, I tend to doubt that Jan really really needs me, right? He's very self-sufficient in that sense. But in general, our capacities are are, are not only a matter of, of our own, but, but also uh, of this, uh, of, this uh, of how we interact with the context, right? Um, in light of this, there is one thing that is important to, to, to have in mind, which is that this context is also a context of that afford us the, the, the possibility of success in some sense. And something that, that Farah says is, is the, the following, that to have the ability to perform the feat, the feat what that one is trying to do, one must, in addition to having the capacity, and here he is uh, distinguishing between having the capacity and having the ability, be disposed to succeed in performing the feat with one tries. That is, you could think of nobility in terms of you have something might be noble for you in one sense in terms of capacities, in, in, in the sense of you having the capacity to know it, but also in you having the ability to know it, and the ability to know it will require some sort of counterfactual success. That is, if one would were to try, one will have success. But that is on its own problematic because then it, it requires us requires us to 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 make sense of in what range of cases success is really necessary. You may think that you will only have, for example, you may think that you only have the ability to, to do something if you are regularly successful in your performances. But maybe you might, you might rather think that this uh, range of successes can be rather slim. For example, if something is really, really hard, it doesn't really matter that you regularly succeed in doing it. It just suffices for you to say that you're able to do it, that you do it sometimes. Right. So you will have a range of possible success conditions that are related to, to, to your possession of capacities and abilities that, that has, has to be sorted out. Can you go to the next uh, slide? So this is important uh, when it comes to, to getting to grasp what sort of, of, of thing is these capacities to know, right? On the one hand, as we said before, we, it could be just uh, the thing about us, like how we are up to the task in a way. This is why Farah says that one has the capacity to perform some feat, provided one's internal constitution does not rule out the performance of that, of, of that feat, right? So success is not ruled out in a way. 
But going back to the point of, of possibility, we can ask, uh, does having the capacity to do something entail having the possibility to do it? That is this issue about the possibility of success. And there are reasons to think that, that perhaps this is an assumption that we shouldn't make, that the capacities have to do something with, it, with possibility. For consider cases uh, like this. Suppose that time travel is possible. It might be metaphysically impossible for Tim to kill his grandfather before his own time of birth, even though they have the capacity for it. If we're willing to grant that, then the link between capacity and ability and possibility breaks down. Another case would be that suppose that time travel is impossible, then it would be metaphysically impossible for Tim to talk to his deceased grandfather, even though he has the capacity for it, right? And this question about, about the relation between possibility and, and capacity and ability, right, matters to how we formally develop these conceptions, right? When we spell out formally, like more specifically, the semantics of something like Farah's approach of knowability in terms of the capacity to know, then we will be forced to, to deal with this sort of possibility that you might be capable or able to do something that is impossible if we are willing to go in that direction, right? So that is an open, an open problem. And um, well, that, that is the main, the main issue that, that we just wanted to, to highlight here. Another issue has to do with the individuation of, of capacities in terms of how general this have to be, but we can maybe discuss that in the, in the Q&A. So maybe it's time just to summarize what we have shown you. First, we introduced the notion of knowability as possible knowledge. But this conception is difficult to square with the factivity of knowability, as we saw, without the issue of restricting knowability to necessary truths, which is an impalatable uh, consequence. A different approach would be to, to do as Schleder does, uh, account for knowability in terms of contrafactual knowledge of some sort. For example, in terms of the successful pursuit of a line of inquiries. And that gives us an effective concept of nobility. Um, but only if one takes into account the internal structure of lines of inquiries and if one restricts these inquiries to ones pursued by actual agents. So even though it's promising, it has certain limitations and, and issues that have to be addressed. And in the third place, we have introduced this this class of conceptions of nobility that puts it in, in relation with the capacity to have knowledge, which is also a factive conception. But as we pointed out in, 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 some, in some detail, the notion of a capacity is underdeveloped, especially in relation to, to this link between what's external and what's internal in this setup of having a vast capacity. For example, in the case of uh, technological and social factors, and also in relation to to the link between success and uh, the possession of abilities. I hope it has been uh, I hope these these conceptions that that we have presented uh, are helpful, and we thank you. Okay.